Okay, Anjay. Thank you, Michelle. On behalf of the Global Climate Pledge, we want to welcome you to our virtual webinar. My name is Anjay and I'm the Climate Justice NGO team coordinator. We're joined here today by our CEO, Michelle, of the US Green Chamber of Commerce and creator of the Global Climate Pledge. Joyce, the Sustainability Communication Coordinator, Constance, the Media Director, mm. Jeff Larson, member of the Rotary Club of Newport Beach and advisory member okay. of the US Green Chamber of Commerce. Sydney, our Communications Associate, Claire, the Sustainability Expedition Associate. We are excited to have you at our first climate webinar in 2024. And I'll pass it on to Michelle to make a few remarks. Thank you so much, Anji. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for this very special program. Um, before we get started with our main event, and as more people are coming into the webinar, I am very honored to introduce one of our US Green Chamber of Commerce board members, Steve Bender, who is also the president of Rotary Club of Newport Beach. Steve is closely aligned with the program today as he is responsible for making introductions to us and the Caribbean Coral Restoration Team, where he has actively promoted Rotary Reefs Project. He, is also, he also has an additional um, special project related to ocean protection. Steve, are you with us? Yes, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Uh, yes, I want to thank everybody for attending today and uh, kind of introduce everybody to the uh, the coral team down in um, Bocas del Toro. I've never met anybody with as much passion about saving the coral and all the projects. Uh, I'm going to leave them to talk and just say thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, uh, enjoy enjoy the conference. And I know that we have the flyer up for you, Steve, for the the um, say no to petrochemical sunscreen. Yes, this is a program we have that anybody we will put the the Rotary Club name at the top of any of these uh, posters for anybody to use in their uh, area around the world. We're trying to totally uh, ban petrochemicals on sunscreens, et cetera, et cetera. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. And as we get going here, I first want to give a huge thanks to our collective team for their dedicated time in organizing and promoting this webinar. We, we just wouldn't be here without their time and talent and connections and skills. And our team is hosting this webinar as part of Global Climate Pledge in collaboration with the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. As far as our agenda today, we will have our speakers present for 15 to 20 minutes each. And then we invite you as our participants in the Q&A session. In today's program, the Sustaining Our Blue Horizons, we will learn firsthand about how we can build resiliency and learn about new adaptation tools and resources for our oceans with hopefully very clear step-by-step -step processes to make that happen that each of us can take away today. We will hear success stories from NOAA related to initiatives off of the California coast. And then we will learn about the Caribbean coral restoration projects in Panama. So many thanks to our informative speakers for sharing their expert knowledge with us today. It is a true honor to welcome them, their supporters, if any of you are with us today, and all of our webinar attendees. I will now pass it over to Joyce to share a bit more about our Q&A. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we will be having a Q&A and a full discussion after the speakers are finished speaking. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the event, please hold your questions to the end or send the chat message to Anji and we can relay those questions to the speakers later. All right, so... Today, each of our speaker, speaker are two renowned um, 
speaker in their in the marine marine conservation effort. And we're thrilled to present you, Sean Hastings and Randy Sinski, um, and present you the effort and their innovative solution to preserve our ocean. And um, back to you, Sydney. Thanks, Constance. All right, so let's get started. Our first speaker today is Sean Hastings from NOAA, and he will be discussing how NOAA's Protecting Blue Whales and Blue Skies program reduces shipping's environmental impact along California's coast and also addressing whale endangerment and nitrogen oxide emissions. So Sean has over 20 years of experience with NOAA's Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. As the policy information and management officer, he is responsible for the development of policies and programs to address industrial, military, commercial, and recreational uses and impacts in and around the sanctuary. Um, so Sean helps create the Marine Protected Area Network to restore local fish and invertebrate populations and habitats in the sanctuary. And in addition, with a multi-agency coalition and community support, he moved international shipping lanes to protect endangered whales. So I cannot wait for all of you to hear his presentation, presentation today. I know I'm super excited about it. So please let me introduce to you, Sean Hastings. Great. Hey, thanks, Sydney. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks to your whole team. Wonderful to be with all of you today. Uh, can you all see some big, beautiful blue whales on your screen? Yes. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And a, a shout out to my Southern California friends who I see joining. Annie here from Santa Barbara, kind of a Peloton style shout out to you all. Jeff down there in Newport. Um, the best way to do this talk would be honestly, if we were on a whale watching boat together, enjoying these big, beautiful blue whales that visit the Southern California Bight every summer. Um, just a couple warnings. One, there's a couple graphic images of the problems we're trying to address here. And secondly, you're gonna be left with a sense of hope because we are on to a project and a program that is helping bring back these whales from the brink of extinction in a way that maintains, as you see here in the slideshow, sustainable commerce. Uh, goes without saying that the global economy depends on maritime commerce. 90% of all goods are moved around the world on big ships. So if you think about that, almost everything you're wearing, the offices you're in, the cars you drive have moved by ship at some point. And uh, while this is super important to the global economy, it's not without impacts. So let me share some of those with you and then uh, discuss how we're addressing the impacts of global shipping in a way that maintains this vibrant commerce in a way that's beneficial to not only whales, but to ourselves. Little orientation um, to the National Marine Sanctuary Program where I've had the, the pleasure of working uh, with my colleagues around the country, around the world for uh, over 20 years. National Marine Sanctuaries are federally designated marine protected areas. And you see here uh, a map of the United States and the, the Pacific, uh, the deep Pacific Ocean. And hopefully you see a sanctuary near where you live. Um, hopefully you do live near a marine sanctuary. Uh, I'm here in the Channel Islands. There's three others in California and a, uh, uh, another sanctuary soon to be designated. National Marine Sanctuaries protect the, not only the natural resources, but also the cultural and historic resources that we find in our ocean treasures. And they're beautiful, wonderful places to visit, to enjoy, to engage in the ocean, whether you fish or dive, surf. And um, I really like that pledge for a cleaner sunscreen. Uh, because we all need to do our part to keep these national marine sanctuaries the, as the national treasures that they are. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, we'll zoom out and zoom in at the same time. You see, the focus area I'm going to discuss today is the California coastline. All of those green tracks that you see moving around the world, those are ships. Ships carry transponders, just like every airplane does. A transponder signals where the ship is, who it is, how fast they're moving. Uh, I think you'll probably be impressed as I am with, wow, look at the amount of commerce moving across our global oceans. And where you zoom in and you see the dark red, that's where all of these ships are coming into port to offload their goods and pick up uh, other, other goods to move around the world. So in Southern California, we have the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. 
really important, vital ports to our nation, moving 40% of uh, imports to the country. And just in my neighborhood here, we have Port Wainimi. Interesting fact, it moves most of the cars coming into the west coast of the United States and bananas. America's, we, Americans, we like our bananas. Okay, let's get a, a little closer to the California coastline. Those red tracks, that's when the ships come over from Asia, they drop off their goods in Los Angeles, and then they move up and down the coast, the ports of San Francisco, that's ports in San Francisco and up to Seattle and Tacoma. On the left, you see these uh, species distribution models. A little orientation for you. Where it's dark blue, that means that's where we see and predict there will be high concentrations of blue humpback and fin whales. These are these magnificent large beasts that come to the California coastline in the summer months to feed. They're, they're here because of our rich oceanic waters that uh, through a process of upwelling, bringing nutrients up to the surface and helping sustain the, the ecosystem of pelagic fish and krill at uh, the base of the food chain, basically. And these animals are here to enjoy that bounty. Blue and fin whales focus on krill. They're little shrimp-like uh, critters. And humpbacks are, are sort of like your bears. They're om uh, omnivores. They can eat krill and or uh, different fish like anchovies and sardines. Probably easy to tell where you see the overlap of these, uh, this, the habitat of these animals and the ship, uh, the ship tracks. That's where we have our problem, where ships and whales are in the same place in the same time. The issue we're working on is ship strikes. Now, before I move on, uh, we need to understand that there was whaling in the world at commercial scale all the way up until the 70s, 1970s, in my lifetime. Uh, and it's this hunting that brought these populations of whales down to the brink of extinction. There, since hunting has been largely banned across the world, their recovery has been slower than we want. Their populations are still considered endangered or threatened. And the major impacts on these animals are number one, ship strikes, as well as entanglement and fishing gear. Here's what we know. And what we know is only what we can see. By that, what I mean is whales are hit by ships. And when they float, when they come into a port on the bow of a ship, as you see in the lower right corner, this uh, fin whale, for perspective, that's a 60 foot fin whale on the bow of a ship to give you a sense of how big these ships really are. We only know what we see, meaning we, uh, many, many more animals are hit, they're struck, and these animals sink. They're naturally uh, negatively buoyant. That's what makes them fantastic divers to go down and grab their food. But when they're killed, they sink out of sight, out of mind. So the numbers that you see here are only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of animals that we uh, believe are struck by ships. Um, the image of the humpback whale with those big, beautiful, long pectoral fins uh, is from the central coast. That's a, a whale that we've known for many, many years. Uh, her name uh, is Fran, and unfortunately she was struck and killed by a ship. The other thing to point out here is it may look like, wow, all these whales are getting hit outside the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, as I mentioned, uh, San Francisco. Probably not. They're probably brought into the ports on these ships or they're struck just outside the ports. And so you're going to see some of the efforts we're working on to either separate ships and whales and where we can't separate ships and whales, slow them down. All right. So one of the best parts of my job is where are the whales? We need to know where they are and where the ships are. The ships carry the transponders, as I mentioned. Some of the whales have tags on them when we research them, but not all of them. So once a month, uh, I have the, uh, the pleasure of flying the Santa Barbara Channel over the shipping lanes. Those are the purple lanes you see on the screen there, counting whales. And you can see over a six month period, we have quite a few whales in the Santa Barbara Channel in and around the National Marine Sanctuary. These sightings help build the, the models I shared earlier with you on trying to understand where do we predict the whales will be, will be, and then looking at the overlap of where the ships are. Okay, I'm gonna talk about one of the tools in the toolbox to protect these animals. 
vessel speed reduction, slowing ships down. Now, I'm not going to go into as a whole other talk on separating ships and whales, which is clearly one of the best ways to reduce any conflict. If you can separate the two, pro the two issues from each other, where whales are feeding, where ships are uh, transiting, uh, you can reduce ship strikes. We can't move the whales. I've been asked that. Sorry, we can't move them. Ships, we can move ships. Uh, and we have adjusted shipping lanes. We have designated areas to be avoided, which is an international designation that governs where ships can go and can't go. But eventually the ships have to come into port and leave port. And it's this intersection of shipping lanes and where whales are feeding, where we have vessel strikes. So if we can't separate ships and whales, we are trying to slow the ships down. And my parent agency, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, working with the U.S. Coast Guard and the Environmental Protection Agency, we issue every year a seasonal management. We designate a seasonal management area, vessel speed reduction zone, and we request the ship slow down to 10 knots. What you see here are these gray boxes. These are the vessel speed reduction zones. Um, these notices go out May 1st and last through the middle of December. That's when we have the greatest concentration of whales off our coastline. And we've been doing, uh, the government, the federal government has been issuing these recommendations for over 15 years. I'll cut to the chase. They're not working as well as we hoped. Uh, we see about a 60 to 65% cooperation from ships, meaning 65% of the time they're slowing down to 10 knots. 10 knots is the magic number where the ship still has maneuverability. We want safe navigation. And at the same time, it reduces the, the risk of a lethal ship strike. So these ships like to travel at 15 to 20 knots to move goods as quickly as possible. That's too fast for the whales. It also exacerbates air quality, which is going to um, lead me into a program we started to try and enhance this voluntary program to make it stick, to make it work. And that's called protecting blue whales and blue skies. We were not satisfied with the uh, lack of cooperation with the vessel speed reduction request. And so working with local air districts in California, we created the Blue Whales, Blue Skies program, which incentivizes the industry, shipping industry, to slow down to 10 knots May through December. Air districts are very interested in slowing ships down because, as I mentioned, air quality is one of the major problems, issues with shipping. Ships burn really, really dirty fuel and huge amounts of it. It impacts coastal Californians like Annie and Jeff and myself. We're living along the coast here and millions of people live along the coast. Air quality is a big issue, a big problem on any coastline where you have shipping. And as we discussed, slowing ships down reduces the risk of fatal ship strikes to whales. It also reduces ocean noise. So we have this amazing consortium of air districts and sanctuaries incentivizing ships and their companies to slow down. And the incentives um, are really interesting. It's a positive public relations campaign. By simply saying, we acknowledge when you are working with us to conserve the ocean, we will celebrate you, we'll bring you recognition. And the shipping companies really enjoy it and they're slowing down. This year alone, um, uh, well, in 2023, we asked ships to slow down and we had over 80% cooperation. It's just fantastic. On the East Coast of the United States, my agency regulates ships to slow down and they have about an 80% compliance rate with the regulation. We're achieving that with a voluntary incentive-based program. So here are some of the highlights from last year. Most importantly, look to, the, look to the right to the shipping companies that achieve these different award tiers that we establish, and they really strive to do their best. Some of these companies, CA, CMA, CGM, slowed down all of their ships off California 96% of the time. That's just fantastic. I'll have for you uh, soon to follow, and I'm happy to provide this to the audience. What are the environmental benefits of this? Um, reducing ship strikes is over 50% reduction in the risk of a ship strike. Thousands of metric tons of greenhouse gases not emitted. Ocean noise reduced by over five decibels. These numbers are significant off California. 
Here's examples of the positive public uh, recognition that we generate to celebrate these companies and bring recognition for, for, um, for the efforts they're putting forward to do the right thing. These, um, uh, you can see here, the, the biggest print um, and radio and TV distribution channels for media. We take out paid advertising. Uh, it's out in all the shipping trade journals and business journals. And the companies, they don't care not just about the recognition. Their crews, their captains are proud of the fact that they are moving commerce in a more sustainable way. You see down here the whale tail awards, coveted whale tail awards. These companies, these crews, these boardrooms of these major shipping corporations, they love the whale tail award. So I hope what you see here is that uh, a, another way of doing conservation doesn't necessarily have to be regulation. Uh, you can use positive public relations to get there. This is where I want to uh, leave the next couple of slides with all of you. These ships are moving the goods that we all as consumers want from companies that um, uh, are, these are global companies. We're trying to engage these corporations in an ambassador program. The corporations are filling these containers moved by ships. They're putting cars that they build on the ships for all of us. And we're engaging these corporations to say, join our effort, support and work with the shipping lines that are slowing down um, at the highest levels. And send a message to your, uh, your customers that you ship sustainably. You see here, this is just the beginning of our corporate amb ambassador program. Most of these companies are California based and we're looking to expand that because there's 15 companies in the world that move over 60% of all the goods. Uh, they're companies that we know well, Walmart, Ikea, Amazon, and they, um, what they don't know is they're all, we're already shipping with companies in our program that are slowing down. We want to bring this recognition, share these environmental benefits, not just for them, but for ourselves. This is, uh, this is uh, what we have left on the horizon to work on. We will continue to try and separate ships and whales. We will continue to enhance our incentive-based program. And really, we need input from all of you on what corporations do we need to engage? And lastly, we want to really um, move from verifying that ships are slowing down to certifying that ships are slowing down. And by that, I mean, think of the products that you buy where they have labels on them that let you know as a consumer that they were produced more sustainably. They were produced with organic products and fair trade. I think we should also expect that they were moved around the world more sustainably. And so we're trying to evolve our program from verifying ships are slowing down to certifying that the products on those ships were moved in a whale safe manner. Really appreciate your time. I look forward to questions and uh, to Randy's presentation and I will um, stop right there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sean, for that presentation. It's pretty amazing that simple changes like just slowing ship speed can create such a huge positive impact. Wow. Um, but just reminding everybody that we will have a Q&A session after both speakers present. Um, and now I'm going to pass it off to Claire to introduce our Caribbean coral restoration speaker. Thank you again, Sean. Thank you, Sydney. And thank you, Sean, again, for a wonderful presentation. Our next speaker, who was originally Doug Marcy, the founder of the Caribbean Coral Restoration Center, is unfortunately feeling unwell and is unable to join us. However, we are so honored to have Randy Sinski, also from the Caribbean Coral Restoration Center, join us instead. She has worked for over 30 years in the animal science field as a veterinary technician and wildlife biologist. She is also an avid swimmer and scuba diver, which allows her to effectively use the skills and knowledge in every day, day operation of the Caribbean Coral Restoration. Randy, thanks again, and back to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. And Sean, um, uh, thank you for that presentation. And it's quite amazing that we're both, um, you know, uh, championing these animals, you're like with the largest and I'm with the smallest. And, um, uh, you know, I, I can't help but think about the shipping vessels. We have smaller vessels come through this way that um, when I'm underneath the water at 25 feet working on some of these corals, um, the amount of sediment that gets kicked up and totally blurs the, the vision 
of um, that I almost have to just sit still until it clears a little bit before I, I get in trouble. So um, I can't imagine the bigger vessels and there's probably the same amount of uh, 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 sediment that would get kicked up by these in that area as well, not to mention the uh, just the, the the problems with the with the whales and the other animals. And um, these are things that um, people just don't realize. And I never have ever seen a picture of a whale um, on on a boat like that. Um, and you would think after all these years, the, the visuals would be out there, right? Uh, but I've never noticed that or knew that before. And this is a new, um, a, a new fact to add to my vocabulary when talking about uh, the destruction of what's going on and, and how everybody's sort of numb to it, I guess, um, which is what we're running into here. Um, let me get up here and uh, get my screen on for y'all. Let me see, hold on one second. The best practice in the world, right? Yes. Go back to the top. Okay. So we, um, why won't that start at the beginning? With the manual way, there we go. So not quite as fancy as uh, um, Sean presentation, but can you see this now? Is this up on the screen, the Caribbean Coral Restoration? Yes. Restoration to Rescue. So for years, um, you know, we were sort of uh, taking broken corals or damaged corals and fragmenting them and putting them in nurseries and restoration trees and getting them to um, grow. And then we would take these uh, corals that have grown and put them on outplanted uh, artificial reef structures. Um, we have had um, a lot of destruction in the last year with the uh, temperatures in the ocean. Um, let me go back just a minute and show you where we are. This is, um, can you see my cursor on here or not? You can't. Oh, goody. Yes. Um, so we concentrate, this is Isla Salarte, one of the uh, five um, islands in the uh, Bocas del Toro uh, archipelago. And uh, we concentrate on this side of uh, Salarte right now. We have nurseries and um, habitats set up throughout the archipelago, but most recently with the uh, devastation of what's going on, weather and uh, the heat, we've tried to concentrate our efforts um, close by where we literally could swim to it if we had to. So um, this is a... Uh, drone video that was um, taken just recently. And you can see the the reef system along, this is the edge of Salarte that I was just talking about. And um, these areas, uh, this was a barrier reef. It was a, a huge coral barrier reef. It, it's not anymore. You can see some color here, these tiny little, um, starlet coral heads, um, <clears throat> but a lot of this is um, is gone at this point. There's patches of coral habitat uh, remaining in certain areas, but uh, for the most part, um, you know, we have done what we call a drag uh, dive in which we literally use ropes, get behind the boat, and we go back and forth in a grid pattern looking for uh, specialized corals. And um, we did that for two and a half hours, almost three miles and um, came up with hardly anything, maybe a few fish and a few corals. So, um, and again, this is um, what's left out here um, is, and this is a nice area here with some starlet coral and, um, this is out in front of the Caribbean Coral Restoration Center. So these are areas that we've been protecting and working on. Um, 
And uh, and again, this is just going down the entire uh, line of Solarte there. So um, again, here's another starlit coral um, head that was there. Um, well, we're not gonna do that again, anyhow. So um, here's, here's what the problems are. The temperatures beginning in late May of 2023, right? So almost a year ago, and they lasted through January of 2024 and into February. This is what we're talking about. We're talking at 31.6 degrees Celsius at 13, almost 14 meters deep. That's hot. One more time. And this lasted for months and months and months. Uh, we're used to it lasting for a few months, September, October, maybe late August, September. It's sort of a normal uh, normal phenomenon now, let's put it that way. It shouldn't be normal at all, but um, but this one started early and, and crushed so many things. We took temperatures from um, five feet or one and a half meters down to 13, uh, almost 14 meters at five um, or 1.5 uh, meter increments. Um, so we did this every day in two different locations for over eight and a half months. We're still doing it today. Um, we're finally getting a little bit of relief um, at those temperatures, but it's it's almost too late for at least 50% of the corals that were there. Um, they have died and, and turned into an algae blob almost and some have collapsed. So um, uh, yeah, this is um, what we're dealing with at this point. And here's some of the things that we've witnessed. Um, this was in uh, early of 2023. Um, probably January, February. This is a beautiful staghorn uh, colony that was um, uh, live with fish and uh, all kinds of marine life. And then this is what happened. This was in July. So if you can see the uh, white area is bleached and then underneath, it's hard to see here, but it's algae already. And at this point, this system um, is completely collapsed. It's um, it, it's gone. Here's another area. These are outplanted staghorn corals that we have on one of our um, artificial reef systems. Um, down in here is the artificial reef system here, and here's the staghorn that's been outplanted onto it. And behind here is more staghorn that's been planted. Um, and here's this same system. It's a wider view of it, but this is um, all completely bleached. And this again is in July. And at this point, we've lost all the staghorn that we've outplanted on this, um, this artificial reef system. This is a uh, star coral um, natural reef that's attached to an artificial reef system. And this was again in early 2023. And here's what it looked like in July. And um, I just took a peek of it, it um, the other day and um, maybe, 30% came back, which is good. This little brain coral seems to have recovered. So um, that's a good thing. But again, if we keep losing 50% every year, eventually you get down to, you know, 50% of 1% is not much, right? So this is a staghorn uh, tree in one of our nurseries. Um, and this was early in 2023. And then again, the same staghorn um, in July. So uh, we've lost a lot of the staghorn, the natural colonies we have lost. So um, that we know of in the archipelago, the natural staghorn colonies that we would go and visit for broken corals to bring to the nurseries in order to get them to, uh, to clone and to propagate, um, all the ones that we have visited this year are gone. So the only staghorn that we know of that we have left is what survived this uh, heat event in um, our nurseries. Um, and surprisingly, there's some still hanging in there and there is still some uh, corals in our uh, nursery areas that, that have survived this heat event. So we call these resilient corals, right? These are corals that are going like, I don't care, bring it on, you know? 
do what you can do. I can stand this. I can, I'm strong. So they've been hit with uh, the heat. They've been hit with the um, acidification from, from carbon um, uh, drops. They've uh, pollution, uh, overfishing, um, just human destruction, basically. Um, and it's been too many pokes at one time. I always say this in a um, in a general term when I'm talking to visitors at the at the center that you know if, if somebody if if you lost your job your house burned down your kids left you your husband got you got divorced whatever it is right so how many of these pokes can you take before you finally sort of sit back and go I'm done I can't do it anymore or your immune system is so stressed that eventually whatever disease comes through is going to um, nail you. So these corals are sort of reacting the same way. They've just had so many stressors put on them at once. And this last heat event was way beyond what any of us predicted um, this quickly, uh, but it happened. And um, unfortunately this year um, predictions um, are gonna be worse than what they were um, this year. So what do we do, All right? We have to rethink what, what our original plan was. Um, we had talked about a land nursery and a seed bank because of the stony coral tissue loss disease that's been affecting Florida and much of uh, uh, areas in the Caribbean it has not come this far yet, but it's an ocean disease. And so we'd be foolish to think that it's not gonna affect us. So when we first start, started talking about land uh, nurseries and seed bank broadcast breeding labs, we um, were seriously considering what would happen if this stony coral tissue loss disease struck the Bocas area. So we started to build something in order to get corals out of the ocean and protect them um, from these viruses and bacterial diseases that it cause destruction. You can take a, a 500,000 year old coral head and it'll be gone in two weeks if it gets hit with this disease. So what you do is you get these um, resilient, uh, healthy corals to breed in a, um, a lab setting. And then you're with the babies um, from the corals, you then can put those back out into the ocean and eventually hope that you either the disease passes, um, they become resilient to it or resistant to it. Um, but we know for sure if we don't do anything that it's gonna um, hit these uh, corals that, that are sitting in the ocean, um, just trying to make it uh, through everything else. So, but now here comes the heat. So we've decided that, you know, it's time to step it up and figure out how to protect these corals. Um, the cost, the expense of this, um, on a commercial level was um, something that was just not um, attainable by our NGO. Um, we're a grass, green grassroots group and uh, we're doing what we can. We employ indigenous uh, community members and we are active every day in the water doing everything and anything we can to make a difference. So to drop $140,000, $200,000 on a uh, lab system, uh, makes it um, impossible for us. So um, Doug, Marcy, who is not, well, he's kind of here, but you know, I'm the one that's filling in. He has designed this system um, at a cost that's affordable to um, almost any small NGO uh, group or large that would want to um, start protecting the corals um, that are um, endangered right now. So any of the reef building corals um, are what we're looking at. This is the holding tank uh, that comes in from the ocean. So this big blue tank, um, uh, we fill it with uh, uh, water from, from, from the ocean. Um, and then it goes through a filtration system and a cooling off system. So it goes through a mechanical um, uh, organic uh, filtration, mechanical filtration, and then a the UV sterilization. So this will not only protect the corals from the diseases that are possibly headed our way, 
but it also helps us to um, control the temperature of the water. So you have to understand if we're bringing in ocean water, right? We're bringing it in at 89 degrees because that's what the temperature is out there right now. So um, the water then in the tanks uh, will then again be 89 disease, 89 um, degrees. And then um, how do we cool that down economically? So Doug uh, figured a way to um, use the groundwater, which is uh, set at um, 70 degrees normally um, because we're in a rainforest type area. So uh, the constant rain helps to uh, pull that water down. We sink a tank in the ground uh, in which the salt water from the tanks can go into there, into that um, tank in the ground. And then the outer um, outside of the tank is cooled by this groundwater. So we have, you know, 85 to 89 degree water coming in from the ocean. And we're cooling that to an average of looking at my notes, um, 77 to 78 degrees. Um, and it's just a circulation um, uh, path, right? So we take 5,000 gallons of water and we turn that over six times a day. It gets um, filtered, sterilized, and cold um, on all of these turnovers. And, um, and then we have water. This is the um, mechanical uh, filters. And um, if we go back, that's these are the UV uh, sterilization uh, filters on here. Um, and here we have our tanks um, in which the uh, corals uh, uh, reside. Uh, so this is our whole system, and we figured out how to do this for um, somewhere between fifteen and thirty thousand um, dollars, depending on where you can get the land and the build and the materials in your area. And right now we're working on a um, a grant with Cordap that will allow us to film um, the uh, assembly of, of this equipment and uh, a written proposal with the um, uh, with how we're doing this and then be able to help um, smaller NGOs protect the corals that they can protect. Um, if we don't get these corals somewhere where they're gonna be safe, um, the most resilient of them are eventually, I mean, whether it's a chemical spill or a anchor drop or um, just more, uh, battering from human uh, ignorance, I guess. Um, eventually, the strongest of the strong are, are going to have trouble. So we get these corals. Here's one that we got from our, here's one we got from our nursery. And here's one that in the um, land nursery now. So this one was from the uh, uh, ocean nursery, so in situ. This one is from the uh, land nursery, so the exit too. And what we do is get these guys to then uh, spawn, uh, produce prodigy, and then we get those off and out onto the artificial artificial reef structures that we have been um, implementing in our program. So as the coral reefs um, collapse, we need to rebuild them and give uh, the animals, marine animals, a place to live. Right. So, I mean, if your house burns down, what do you do? You got to go find a place to live. So the fish leave and they go find a place to live. If we supply them with a home, they move in. So this not only provides habitat for the fish and other marine life, but it also will help establish the sustainable fishing practices for indigenous community. The indigenous community in this area um, are literally um eating white rice and sugar at this point. They no longer have fish. There's nothing for them to catch anymore. And this isn't just this area. This is many other areas in the world. So um, people that used to be able to just go out and catch their dinner, it's no longer available. So um, anyhow, this is one of the artificial reef structures um, that was just put into the water. This is again, a bunch of artificial reef structures that have been put into the water. This is an artificial reef structure a few years out. 
So you would barely notice this is another one, another artificial reef structure a few years out. So you can see the, um, I like to call it the city effect. So you got the sponges and the anemones and the, the fish and the, um, you know, it's like the city where the coral eventually want to move in. They're the last ones that, that seem to want to come along, but because they're smart, they wait to see that everything else is doing well and then they move in. So um, this is again, is a, uh, um, an example of a newly placed structure, and that's uh, one of the rotary wheels there, and then um, some structures that have been there for a while. This is an artificial reef structure, and you can see this is self-attached um, uh, fire coral on this uh, uh, structure arms right here. Um, and okay, here's the Randy, fish. I just want to give maybe a one minute heads up. Okay, all right, good. Let me get through this then. Um, this is again the more more fish, and these were some videos. Um, but here again, the fish and the coral um, come along. So, is it worth saving? Is there hope? Absolutely. We've got to do something. You know, we've got to do something, and we know this works, and we know the resilient corals out there. This is polyps from a staghorn. This is again more residents in the artificial reef structures. This is a cannonball jellyfish. Um, this is a basket sea star, all again within our artificial reef systems. This was a new find. This is a um, uh, mountainous star coral that's endangered in the Caribbean right now. And we just ran into this yesterday. So this guy's really resilient, right? He's super resilient. We need to protect these guys. Some of them are out there. This is old man, one of my favorite guys. So um, anyhow, what can you do? Turn your lights off. Stop making a carbon imprint. I'm serious. Stop it. Stop. And then please support people that are actively buying us all time. Um, and this will be recorded. So there's places where you can donate. We have a GoFundMe page. We have a PayPal giving fund. So again, thank you all. Um, you know, there's so much, but um, I hope I covered some of it. I'm, I'm sure I got buzzes from Doug saying, see this? So anyhow, um, I hope it made sense. And uh, I really appreciate your time and talk about it. Tell people what's going on, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Randy, for the presentation. And even though it is disheartening, it is so important to talk about the effects of climate change. And even though coral bleaching is talked about a good amount, it was still really shocking to see the pictures and no difference and a huge difference in a short amount of time. Right. Uh, on behalf of us all, thank you for the work that you and your team have been doing in protecting the coral reefs. And I will now pass it on to Constance. Constance, are you on mute? Here I am. So this concludes both of our speaker presentation and I'm so glad that we're here to tell us about the passion and the fight to get this big or small ecosystem and animals. Um, both of them are fighting for a better tomorrow, for the sea life, for human life, and for a better future. Although those projects those project are local, they can be incorporated into bigger bigger areas like at the international level we encourage you to do the same and support local business around you and kind of like educate yourself about what's around you and uh, we're also going to start with our uh, Q&A and if you have any question um, let's go to Angie about it. yeah um, there have been some questions that were passed on to me during our speaker session. Um, so if you have more, feel free to just drop it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call you. Um, if not, I will just start with some of the questions that have already been, been sent in. Um, so this is uh, for uh, Shane. Um, can you tell us more about uh, environmental issues that led to the need for vessel speed reduction zones? And this is for Sean, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sure. So 
Um, uh, the, the question about additional environmental issues related to shipping, uh, ocean noise, I didn't cover in depth. It's uh, just being studied right now, but we do know that ships with these big propellers that move, move them around the world cause a lot of cavitation. That means they create billions of little air bubbles as the props spin in the water. And as those air bubbles pop, uh, it creates noise. Now, one little bubble may not create a lot of noise, but billions do. And to give you an analogy, if you go to a concert, uh, depending on the kind of music you like, uh, the loudest concerts in the world are around 140, 150 decibels. A ship passing overhead, and as Randy mentioned, when she dives, it literally drowns out all other sound. Uh, these large ships cause upwards of 180 decibel uh, noise in the ocean environment. Sound travels really well, really far in water. And unfortunately, these large whales, they, uh, they're being drowned out. The way they communicate is with very, very, um, uh, very high decibel. And the ship noise drowns out their communications. So not only are the, sh the whales subject to being hit by ships, uh, but they, they simply can't hear each other, communicate with each other when a ship is passing overhead. When you slow a ship down, it creates less cavitation, less noise. So, and this is just thinking about whales. Uh, noise is a really important um, uh, ecological process for many ocean critters. And uh, we're trying to reduce noise impacts around the world's oceans by slowing these ships down. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah. Thanks, Marisha. Yes, and I I apologize. I think that we might only have um, time for one more question, but I do see Annie's hand up if you have a short question and hopefully maybe for Randy, but either way is good. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry. My my question was for Sean, so I'm happy. Oh to... no, go no, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll we'll do two more questions then. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for everyone's presentation. Sean, my question was, um, so I wanted to know a little bit more about why you all, your team and California chose the voluntary route rather than regulatory, as you mentioned, is happening on the East Coast. And also just um, kind of that difference between that 80% compliance uh, on the East Coast versus the 80% voluntary Compliance, is that just the ships that are in this program? And um, kind of clarifying on that, but given the successes of this program, how do you see it scaling and opportunities to apply this program in other parts of the world that are dealing with the same issue? So, sorry, that's a big question. So take a piece of it if, you, um, if you'd like to just answer one piece. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Annie. I am um, the... The issue about regulations is it's very political. It's very complicated. It takes years and years to push through. And we found a way to achieve almost the same results with the regulation through an incentive-based program. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I think I published on this that eventually regulate, regulating ship speeds will be necessary. We need 100% cooperation to maintain commerce at the same time as reducing the impacts of that commerce. So. Um, yes, the 80% is specific to the companies that enroll in our program and participate. There are uh, several other companies that we're trying to entice uh, them to enroll in the program. And we believe through our corporate ambassador program and through consumer pressure, all of us, we can uh, bring those other companies in and push them uh, and push the companies already in the program to slow down more, more miles around the ocean. Not just here, this program is exportable, it's scalable. Uh, and we look forward to working in your communities. Please contact us. We want to bring blue whales, blue skies around the world. These ships move around the world. These whales move around the world. And uh, this program can as well. Great. Thank you, Sean. And we might have time for another question, but I want to encourage all of you to visit their website, to visit Sean Hastings um, Instagram and Randy and the Caribbean Coral Restoration, Instagram, and just share their posts. Like sometimes 
awareness is as easy as sharing a post on your story. And it is so critical. So I would welcome all of you to go to our page and you will see a different, a lot of posts from the coral restoration, the Caribbean coral restoration and the blue sky, blue well, blue sky. So please go give them some love and share um, their topic and or about it tomorrow as well. Go ahead, Michelle, sorry. Now, Angie, do we have one question for Randy and then we will uh, close out our uh, webinar today? Yes, we do. Um, so we, um, someone just wanna hear uh, about the next steps and plans for expanding the techniques of the center in other places. Great question. So um, again, this all gets down to funding. Um, and uh, it's the same sort of I, problem that Sean has, except we have much smaller little animals. A lot of people can relate to whales. So I think it's easier for people to um, have the heartstrings pulled, you know, by the whales, as opposed to the coral. Most people think they're rocks, um, but they're not. They're really smart little animals. Um, so hopefully um we get this um this grant there were 600 and um 600 plus uh applicants uh 132 proposals and they picked 38 and we were one of the 38 of the proposals to be heard and they're going to do 12 to 13 proposals and this is money that's being provided for small um uh grassroot coral um uh, rescue operations. And um, what we feel is with our proposal, we'll be able to send this technology, um, affordable technology to small areas throughout. If you are, in my opinion, and Doug's opinion, and um, several other people in this field of restoration, that if you restore in coral at this point, you need to start seriously to think about putting a seed bank lab in. Um, if you haven't been hit yet with the heat, it's coming. And we saw firsthand the devastation of what's gonna happen. So, um, you know, this is uh, uh, going forward. You have to be able to protect these resilient corals um, in some manner, and we have a way to do it that's affordable. So. Um, I hope that answered the question, um, but uh, anyhow, that's, uh, it, it's changed for us and it should be changing for a lot of the restoration groups. Um, you know, just uh, know that even though you might be growing corals at this point, what do you do when the temperatures heat up like they did here? We never expected this. Um, so we did what we could do and you can cry in your diving mask because we've seen it. We've seen so many of our efforts in so many of the animals that we have been watching for years die before our eyes. So, um, and if the small animals dying, the big animals are next. Um, so keep that in mind. We're all connected. Um, and, uh, the coral is probably our first, um, our first, uh, what's the word I want to use? It's 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 where we get most of our oxygen from. We the reefs go. There's not going to be much left. Um, eventually, maybe in twelve thousand years, they'll figure it out and and be back. But I don't want to see what happens in the meantime. So let's do something um, to uh, buy us some time and, and save what we can. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I know that we um, are four minutes over time, so we'll close out the meeting here. I Today, we heard from two remarkable speakers who are making a significant impact on our environment overall. Sean, you know, we are so grateful for your that your for your shared insights on the protecting blue whales and blue skies program. We need these rolled out worldwide to help others reduce the environmental impact of shipping industries. And there's not many voluntary proven programs. I know there was a question in there about voluntary versus regulatory um, that we didn't quite get to, but there's not many voluntary proven programs that engage both the community and business. So from the Green Chamber of Commerce, we really appreciate that. 
So thank you so much for being here today. And Randy, we are also inspired to leverage the years of knowledge. Um, you, Doug, I know, Doug, I hope you're still here with us um, with this new solution package that you're developing, you know, how affordable, and that's so important for that to, to be affordable for especially non-small uh, NGOs. So thank you for your effort in coral restoration in response to the temperature extremes. Um, and you're right, you do just cry in your masks. I had the privilege to visit just last month um, the work that's being done in Bocas del Toro with the Caribbean Coral Restoration. And it's so inspiring. And yet you can see the devastation, which is just uh, heart wrenching. So thank you so very much, um, Randy and Doug for the work that you're doing. And as I know Constance mentioned and others, let's all support these organizations and make conscious choices to protect our oceans, our marine life. Um, it is the little things from a climate perspective that we do at home in our regular day-to-day -day, um, businesses, in our day-to-day -day personal life. That's why we always encourage people to sign the Global Climate Pledge. So if you haven't done so already, please do so. But together we can create a healthier, more sustainable future. And again, thank you to our speakers and all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. And until then, we wish you the strength, we wish you the courage, and most importantly, peace in your efforts to protect this beautiful planet. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thanks all. Thank you.